Welcome to The Happier Attorney. I'm Brita Long, and this is the channel where we talk about how you can change your mindset and use flat fees to become a happier attorney. And my next guest is Leanne Pond, and she is the author of The Engagement Ring. And Leanne is a leader in how to deal with employees. And I shouldn't even say it like that, right? Because it sounds so bad. But I have read a lot of books on managing employees and how to deal with employees. And I can tell you, this is one of the best books I've ever read on employees. And regardless of the size of our practice, at one point or another, we're going to have employees, even if they're virtual. So please welcome Leanne Pond. So welcome, Leanne. How are you? I'm great, Britta. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, and congratulations on the engagement ring. Great book. One of the best I've ever read on employees. So tell me, I'm just going to dive right in. So when we're talking about attorneys, you know, we're a different breed, or we'd like to think we are. And we're very introverted. And this is how I started out being an employer and how every, every other attorney I've ever known has started. You start your practice and you just go and then you start getting busy. And then, you know, the, the treadmill's going a little too fast. So then you're like, okay, I need to hire somebody. And then you get busier. And then by the time you need to hire somebody, you need to hire them today. So, you know, you put an ad out. You used to, now it's all online, but, you know, it used to be in the paper or on Craigslist or whatever. And you get applications in, you, you pick the best one, you maybe call some references if they call back. And this is how I used to hire. So this is what I need you to do. This is what the job is. Ba, 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 ba. You can do that, right? Yes. Okay, you are hired. And it was a disaster. Right. It was just a total crapshoot. And I think that I was better than some attorneys at knowing I needed to be the leader, kind of. I mean, there were, I still definitely had some, this is my practice and I'll come in when I want and I'll dress how I want. And, but you guys need to do X, Y, and Z, regardless of what I do. And so, <laughs> so clearly that wasn't the right way. Let's just get into the book with some caveats that, Attorneys are mostly introverts. Beyond, I mean, beyond. And so some of the things in, in your book, I can tell you, like some of the meetings, most attorneys would rather throw acid in their eyes than do some of the stuff with employees. And I think that a lot of attorneys, we don't think of ourselves as entrepreneurs. And we certainly don't think of ourselves as leaders in our law firm. So can you? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. But just the shift that has to happen. Right. And I guess I'll start in my beginning, which is because how I came to this, which is basically I've got an accounting degree, an MBA. I moved up through the corporate world as a CFO. All of a sudden, I've got people reporting to me with no real uh, you know, training on you know, even MBA. I didn't learn anything about leadership. Uh, tried to wow. do what I could, as many do, tried to model a good good bosses that I had seen and, and do what I saw them do and the things that made me feel good that they did. And then I tried to avoid doing anything that the bad bosses did or anything that made me feel bad. So, you know, you just, you cobble it together and you got people depending on you who are reporting to you and you do the best you can. And uh, I ended up as CFO for the last 15 years for two different companies. One of the departments they give you, because they give you a bunch of extra departments that nobody else knows what to do with always buildings and grounds and IT for some reason, but also HR. And through having HR, I found and became really passionate about how are we developing leaders? And in fact, my last uh, stint for over a decade was my title being chief administrative officer, but really CFO, was for an EMS agency. So local government 911 EMS agency. And what I was seeing was the paramedics who were really good at their clinical skills would get promoted to be a supervisor of other paramedics. And the difficulty was when you're good at technical skills as an attorney, maybe, and all of a sudden you're supervising possibly other attorneys or possibly administrative staff, 
how, how do you make that transition? Because it's a whole different set of skills. Yeah. And so, um, so I ended up developing while I worked there, a leadership uh, academy and helping uh, everyone make that, those transitions and et cetera. And then it, it came to the point where I loved it so much and wondered why I ever went into finance uh, that I was, that was the first thing I wanted to do every day was, was uh, do leadership training. So I uh, started to come up with the idea of do other uh, organizations need this? And ended up leaving, starting my own business in 2018 uh, called Engaging Leadership and uh, putting together a program, basically a structured program to be able to take leaders from that technical role that they were really good at into being in a leadership role that they're really good at. And um, I do that through training classes and um, through coaching and through mastermind groups and anything it takes, mentorship, anything it takes to help leaders along. So from that the program that I developed, that's what I wrote the book on. And the way I came up with it is I wanted data on, like if you were a good leader, how would you know it data-wise? And so I, the the idea would be, well, you'd have maybe a survey. Well, what's there's an employee engagement survey already that a lot of organizations do. So I went and re- did some research. You can Google the, the usual questions. There's usually 15 to 20 questions. I took those questions and looked at each individual one and said, if I was training someone to be a very effective manager of this person, how could we, we get a yes on that question, which is the ideal? So the question might be, do you have the resources to do your job effectively? Has anyone in a leadership role given you feedback over the last 30 days? So questions like that, questions about your teammates and you want a yes question. That's the, that's the ideal. So to get the yes answer, I came with train up with training classes for each of those kind of put them in buckets and what would it be? And so I came, because I love an acronym, uh, I divided up the training classes into a, a catchy acronym, uh, which I call the engagement ring which then became the title of the book. So it's the engagement ring, practical leadership skills for engaging your employees. And let me back up though. Okay. Because I can hear, I can hear the attorneys in my head already. Okay. I'm a solo practitioner. I have one employee. I have two employees. Okay. I I'm not creating a hundred person law firm. So why in the world do I need to spend even time reading a book, much less really learning how to be a leader? That's the first thing that attorneys are going to say. Right. Number two, I can, even if they don't admit it out loud, which some do, m- most attorneys, I can tell you, this is the way they think of employees. I pay you to do your job. They have bigger fish to fry. I'm here saving this person's kid. I'm here. I don't have the time, nor why should I, you know, ask you if you're engaged at work, ask you if you have the resources, like, I don't have time for that. That's not my job. And that's for like big corporations or HR or whatever. Like I have more important things to do. And that's the employee's job. You're getting paid to do the job, to do the job. So can you address those two? Okay. Yes. So my question would be, if you have one employee, paralegal, administrative staff, whatever it is, and you lose that employee, think about losing that employee. They have gone, they're leaving you and they're going somewhere else. (laughs) What will it take to replace them? And it takes, uh, it can take a year's salary. of that employee to get the next employee up to speed on hiring, training during the time you're trying to hire you. How are you filling in on that job? You're using temp work. You get that new person in, you want to train. Maybe they're already trained. They're a paralegal, but do they know your office? Do they know the way you do things? How long will it take them to get back up to speed? So if you value the one employee you have, then you want to think about some of these concepts. Because if you don't engage that employee, they will move on. And the statistics show that uh, Gallup did a poll. And in the United States, only one third of all employees are engaged at their job. What does that mean? It means that they are loving their work. They are giving you the best they can give. 
they are going above and beyond. They are not just doing their what's on their position description, but they're going that extra mile. Uh, I use the example of uh, of a uh, someone in a wait staff, a server at a restaurant. They could just take an order, fill the order, bring the food to the table, bring the check. That's their position description. But to be an engaged employee, they are friendly. They are making that customer wanting to come back to the restaurant. They are suggesting appetizers. How about this? How about that? Describing them because they're in, they want to increase that bill. They are describing desserts. They are making the customer feel like family. And in return, the wait staff, because they get tips, are, can, are increasing their own you know, tips, but also increasing the, for the restaurant their income. So an engaged employee can make that little bit of extra difference for the organization. It makes a big difference. Organizations with engaged employees have 21% more profit. So it's been shown to be they have lower turnover. They have higher productivity. So it's an ideal. If you are a leader, manager, supervisor of even one employee, your ideal should be to have an engaged employee because you are getting the most out of that person. And also they're enjoying their job. Supervisors have a great gift that they can give, which is to help your employees want to come to work every day. And uh, so I give the example of a a canoe. If you took 10 employees from any random organization anywhere, put them in a canoe and told them to row towards the organization's mission. What do you want your employee to do? You want them to produce every day, accurate documents, whatever that is, that could be their mission. So you've got your, you've got your employees in the rowboat. You want them to do that. Statistics show that the three in front are rowing like crazy, getting it done, accuracy, quality of work. They're enthusiastic. They're an asset to the organization. The two in the back, 20% of all employees in the United States are disengaged and they are rowing against the people in the front. They're making trouble. They're making it harder. They're making it worse. And five in the middle, 50% of all U.S. employees are unengaged. They're doing the bare minimum, and they're probably not even picking up those oars because they see the, the three in the front are growing. So the, two in the, the three in the front are great. Encourage them, get them, keep them going. The two in the back, you want to take some, uh, some personnel action probably on them. You want some corrective action and maybe help them find another rowboat. Maybe your rowboat is not the right one for them. And they they may need to go on to something that's a better fit for them. But the five in the middle, that's where organizations have the opportunity to make the biggest difference. To turn an unengaged worker into an engaged worker is what is basically what my book is all about. So the the four the w- ways to do that, uh, I do as my engagement ring, so the R-I-N-G. The R stands for relationships. You want to develop a relationship with your employee. One-on-one meetings will help do that, getting to know them, knowing a little bit about their personal life, showing you care, just developing an interpersonal one-on-one relationship. The I in the engagement ring stands for being included. You want to have your employees have a sense of belonging in two different ways. One with the team at work, part of the team, and the other is with uh, communications. You want to keep them in the loop. You want to let them know what's going on. The N in an engagement ring is a feeling of being needed. And a person feels needed if they truly know what the mission is. So what is it you want them to accomplish? How do you want them to accomplish it? What are your expectations? And they know how their job and every task they do every day in that job is going to move that mission forward and achieve what, what uh, they, their job is about. And then the G in engagement ring is opportunities for personal and professional growth at work. And this encompasses some things like how to give that the supervisor gives them feedback, both positive and negative. The supervisor delegates to them and and helps them have stretch assignments and grow. So those are the parts of the engagement ring. And those are the things that can make an engaged employee. And an engaged employee is going to improve your organization or your office. So when you have the employee that, and I've certainly fired employees and it's never pleasant. And when I did, it was, I don't want to say it was too late, but I I knew it was the right thing because I felt instant relief and I probably waited longer than I should have. It's still really hard. 
And I had to fire an attorney once. And that took everything I had. I mean, wow, that was hard. And I, when I'm talking to attorneys, so many have real problems disciplining staff or getting the two out of the boat. And we tell ourselves these stories <laughs> all of the time. Well, they're good with clients. Yeah, they might be stealing from me, but they're good with clients. You know what? I mean, all of the things that we tell ourselves. What would you say to, to someone who is, you know, they know in their gut, you know, they can smell something's wrong here. Right. Um, but just how to get over that, that really you, you need to get the two, you need to get the cancer out of the practice, even if it means you, you don't have a warm body there. Cause that's what I hear too. Like, oh, well, I need to find somebody else before I can get rid of this person. You know, if this person was gone, I'm in chaos. And so what would you, how would you address that with people? Yeah. So it's a relief when you finally terminate someone who's been needing it and it to, to you and to them, honestly, you know, you're helping them move on to where they can, they, their skills are a better fit. So it's not a bad thing. They're not a bad person, but Prior to that, and I hope attorneys will appreciate this because I am big on documentation. So no one should ever be fired and it surprised them. Unless there's something egregious that just happened, they just stole from you and they shouldn't be surprised if they got fired for that. But if you have those mini little micro annoying things and this person, it's just over a period of time, not doing what you need to do. You have to make sure that you're talking to them about it. So we're back to the feedback. Make sure you're giving them feedback positive and negative, but feedback is adjusting them back on track. So they're heading down a road, doing their job, heading toward that goal or, or rowing in the boat. And feedback is adjusting their course a little bit. So you're doing them a favor. It doesn't have to be a bad conversation. Just telling them that they did something and be specific. It caused something and be specific and asking them to do it this different way in the future. Or with positive, negative, you did this. That was great. That caused us to, you know, do this great thing. Keep it up. So feedback is one or two, you know, either of those, good or bad, positive, negative. But the, the negative or the constructive, maybe we should call it, really is going to keep people on track. If you give them feedback for something they've gone off track with, they do it again. Then that's when I follow up after I talk to them again. I follow up with an email to them stating what we talked about. They do it again. You may have things in your office that's corrective action, that's a, a, a line you follow or things you do, maybe put something in writing or, or you know, suspension or whatever it is in your office. But if you have a series of conversations that you've documented, um, emails that you followed up with, and this person continues to do it, and you have to let them know they're heading towards, you know, and even a conversation of, is this job a good fit for you? Because I see you're having problems with these things that you need to do in your job. How can I help you with this? So lots of conversations like that. And then finally, to a point where uh, it's a conversation of uh, this isn't working out for either of us. But then they won't like me. Yeah. And I've actually had, I actually had, I had one client who I was coaching one-on-one -on -one and it was clear she had a larger office um, and she had like 10 employees that one was really pushing boundaries. I mean, just did a good job, but really pushing boundaries. And when we got down to her, why it was, she wanted to be liked. So had, okay. So let me backtrack. If you want to be a leader, manager, supervisor, whatever your job is, if you are going to have a follower, as I say it, if you're a leader and you have a follower and there is a goal to accomplish, you need to make sure number one, that goal is accomplished. And you're not there to be liked. So I talk in my book about being professional and part of being professional. And some of these, when I, you know, these paramedics that would get promoted, one day they're on the ambulance with their coworkers and they're at the bar afterwards and they're on Facebook together. And the next day they start their new job and they are now the supervisor of all those people. And that is extremely difficult. And so they need to be professional. They need to decide that leader, leadership is what they want. They're now in the management team and that's their team. 
and they need to do the things that need to be done to be that manager. And they may not be liked and they may lose friends over it. Right. Yeah. Part of the gig. It is. So um, and I'm, I'm going to get more into some of the things in the book, but I wanted to touch on so many people now, especially with COVID, with everything, um, are going to virtual assistants. How do you how do you deal with that? How do you incorporate that into being a leader and having employees when, you know, it's a virtual assistant, maybe in another country? Right. I mean, it's just a completely different ball game. Yeah. And I think that becomes more of a transactional thing. So they are they are doing transactions for you and you're paying them to do those transactions. And if the transit, if you set the expectations let them know clearly how you expect everything to be done and they don't do it. And you come back and give them feedback on that. You know, sometimes that's easier to get rid of those people and go to another transactional uh, person to replace that. But if this person, there are virtual assistants now who are part of the team who, who work full-time for you or part-time, but are, are integrated into the team, interacting with the team and not just doing transactions. Um, then that person you want to use some of these things with because you're going to get the best work out of them if they feel that, that they can be engaged with what you're doing. And I'm, I'm teaching a lot now on hybrid teams because now that people are coming back to the workplace, but not everybody's coming back, not everybody's coming back every day. How do you handle that? How do you keep, um, you know, I had done remote teams last year. Now we're in hybrid teams. But how do you keep everybody engaged? How do you level the playing field for those who are in the office versus those who are at home? How do they have equal uh, access to resources? So there's a lot of things to consider now that we're a lot of us are virtual. And I can completely see the advantage to having people in office, Um, you know, some virtual or whatever. But I always one of the reasons that, quite frankly, one of the reasons that I did my little empire building thing that was a disaster, but was because I wanted that community. I wanted to build that community where I wanted to go to work and I had coworkers and I had control over them as far as like, you know, I never wanted coworkers again that I didn't have some authority over, but um, I liked that office environment. And I know so many other attorneys like that office environment. And I can see an advantage. I think it would be easier to engage employees in an office environment versus all virtual. I, but I could be completely wrong. Right. I, I think it is. It's much easier because there it is difficult now remotely. And, and some of the things I've been coaching organizations on is, uh, you know, have more frequent meetings. When a person first goes remote, you should be having a one-on-one a couple times a week and you can move off, you know, move back to once a week, but you need to be checking in on how they're doing and people at home being isolated. um, It was really tough during COVID because they weren't getting out otherwise, maybe not seeing family members. So there's a lot of personal check-in with that. And, um, you know, we do Zoom meetings, we do Zoom team meetings. So, you know, I've got icebreakers that I do at in-person meetings, but doing them on Zoom and getting to know people a little better. You know, things like when the meeting first starts, we do a little icebreaker and show something in your office. What is this behind you? Tell us about a picture. In some ways, we're seeing each other in our homes and that can we can get to know each other in a different way that we never were able to before. But well, I see advantage to that because I can, again, I can hear attorneys. I don't have time for that. I don't, I don't care what's behind them. I don't have time for that. Why do that? You're building a relationship. And that's the most of all the things in the engagement engagement ring, R-I-N-G. 70% of engagement is the relationship, direct relationship with the employee to their supervisor. If you don't do anything else, build an open relationship where that person feels comfortable with you. You feel with them. You know them somewhat on a personal basis. We don't need to delve into people's personal life or be part of their problems. but to, be, to treat them as a human, uh, to know them, to know what their goals are, their career goals, to help them with that. Um, and they're not our friend again. We're not going to have them over for Thanksgiving. 
but we want to respect them. We want them to respect us on a professional basis. And we're working together for whatever goal it is that, um, that we're trying to achieve. And we both want to be part of that and feel um, accountability towards it and feel effective and feel capable. So there's so many elements, but I understand somebody who's an, an introvert or isn't into building relationships, you're going to have to, if you are a leader, if you're a supervisor, if you're a manager, you're going to get outside your comfort zone and you're going to have to do this a little bit. Yeah. And one of the things that I loved was in, in the start of the book, talking about essentially taking 100% responsibility. Um, you're the captain of the ship. And if something's going on in your office that shouldn't be, it, it's your fault. Right. <laughs> That's that's a hard pill to swallow. Um, but looking back on my experience with employees, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the you know, the the CEO, the the boss, whoever, uh, whatever your uh, position is, you are setting the c- culture. And um, I'm doing a new book now on corporate culture. And the interesting thing to me about corporate culture, it is the definition I love is the lowest level of behavior that's tolerated in an organization. So okay, this, can you say that again? So corporate culture is the low, like firm culture. Firm culture is the lowest level of behavior that's tolerated in your firm. Ouch. What so what that means is if you say you expect your employees to be punctual, if that's one of your values, and you do not follow through when when employees are late to let them know that they shouldn't that to give them feedback again that they were late and in the future please be on time uh, then that you just lowered your culture so you can say anything you want but it ends up being what you tolerate so you're tolerating non punctuality then that's your culture there. Whatever you're willing to, t- to tolerate, if you tolerate shoddy um, memos, um, shoddy emails, um, poor grammar, whatever it is, that ends up being your cor- corporate culture. And that is your fault because you're not following through on those individual behaviors to bring them up to the level that you say you want them to be. And it's scary because, OK, that person that's late, maybe they do great work. Right. And, and then funny. you're like, ah. They might have a great excuse too. Right. So that's why my so my feedback uh, saying is, it uh, you were late. So you were late for work. Um, when you're late, it causes a delay and and late client client appointments and whatever the. So you did this behavior. The result of that behavior is this, and in the future, please be on time. And that's their opportunity to say, I hit traffic today, you know, whatever it is. And probably you wouldn't say anything the first time, but if it's beginning to be a pattern, second time, third time, you're going to want to say something. You're letting them know that you, this is not tolerated, that you knows, noticed it because they may think you didn't even notice it. They snuck in, they can do it in the future, but you noticed it. It caused a problem for you. And you told them specifically what the problem is. And you ask them, you told them the expectation for behavior in the future. So if they keep on doing it, then you're documenting it. You're going down that road. And then at some point you have to balance that with, is this important enough important to me to terminate this employee because they do everything else well. But I'm going to guarantee you that if someone is habitually late, they do not do everything else well. Oh, tell me about that. That's a sign. Lateness. Okay. If you want to signal that your employees are looking for another job. And by the way, 51% of your employees are looking for another job right now. That's what statistics show. So if you want a sign of which 51% that is, you watch their attendance and their punctuality. Oh, okay. Signs that someone is heading down a road of not being engaged anymore, not caring, and probably looking for another job. So you want to get them back on track. You want to let them know the expectations are, I mean, if they're, if they're taking a lot of vacation or sick days and they're allowed to take them, 
you, there's not too much you can say about that, but I would, I would say it's a sign if they're taking a lot of sick days, it's a sign you may want to just have a conversation. Hey, how are you doing? What's going on? Um, something I highly recommend is a mid-year stay interview. So when, so when employees leave, you should be doing exit interviews, which is a sit down with them probably on their last day, probably not the day they give notice, although you can do it any, anywhere in that. But you want to get them in a good mood. You want to get them willing to talk and usually not having any more days to work there. And some companies do it as a, afterwards as a survey. Um, but it's uh, usually employees, once they're gone, they're not going to answer that survey. So if you can get them to s- sit down the last day, either turning in their keys or whatever, you're friendly, they're leaving on a good note. Um, and you can ask them if they'd be honest about the reasons that they were leaving. That's an exit interview. You can take those reasons and you can assimilate them. Like, do you need to do something about this? Is this something other employees may be feeling? Um, you know, at least you know. The, um, so I recommend you do a stay interview. So employees that are not leaving, at least every six months, you should have a formal interview with them and they know what, what it's about. A sit down one-on-one and you are asking them, why are you staying here? And what would make you leave? Oh, that's scary. Yeah. So if you have an open, if you have a good relationship with them, you've already developed it. They're not scared of you. They're not afraid to tell you honest things. That's the other thing. If you're going to, what are you going to do with that information? If they, if you're the type of person and they know it, that you're going to be irritated and you're going to be in a bad mood for what they told you, or you're going to get back at them, or it's going to come later, or you're going to tell someone. Don't do it. Don't do a stay interview because you're going to make the whole situation worse. But you as a professional are taking in that information and it doesn't feel good because it might be about you. It might hurt a little bit, but you need to take some time. And maybe right then you're like, what? <laughs> but you act professionally and you don't know, let them know that you are bothered by it. And later you think about it. And my favorite saying about criticism is when you get criticism, Hold it up to the light to see if there's any truth before you throw it away. So give yourself a little bit of time. You can see some truth in it. And for them to tell you that took some guts. So so on on their perception, on their side, there's truth. So you're finding out why they're staying and what would make them leave. And that's really great information because you can increase the one and decrease some of the some of the other things. And I say a manager, leader, supervisor, whatever you want to call it, even with one employee. You have three things you need to do every day with that employee. You need to set the direction. You need to remove obstacles to their work. You need to give them the resources. They need to do a good job. And there's actually a fourth one. You need to help them grow. So if you are not that the stay interview is the opportunity to find out what obstacles are in their way, what resources to do they need? Where do they want to go? That's a good, great time to talk about their growth and make sure you're setting your direction all the time, setting, the, set those expectations, let them know what the goals are. What's the quality of work you expect? What's the timeline you expect? What are the deadlines? Always be very specific with all those things. You want to set every, every one of your employees up for success. And can, can we talk a little bit about the, um, how to reward employees? I always uh, prided myself on paying very well. Like I wanted to be even, I mean, and I started hiring people at, you know, 29 when I had no money, but I wanted to always be one of the highest paying employers in the small town I was in. And I thought that if I paid well, and if I gave gifts, you know, and we all went out to lunch every now and again, that was like, what else do you want, people? Right. And I found it, it wasn't as effective as I thought it would be. So when you're wanting to reward employees, what do you suggest? Other than, of course, you know, pay competitively, but what do you suggest? Right. Yeah, statistics show that pay is great. People are happy for a while, but then it becomes an entitlement. It becomes they expect it, you know. Because once you have it, you have it. So uh, that might help if they're looking to move somewhere else. But if everything else is not in place, it's going. They're going to feel that those are golden handcuffs. 
and they're unhappy with everything else except the pay, that's not the type of employee you want to have there. They're not going to be giving their best. They're not going to be engaged. Uh, bonuses, gift cards, things, those should be random. Um, I just, it's like Pavlov's dog, that, that <laughs> theory that random reward works better. So once they begin to expect that they finished this project, and every time they finish this project, they get a bonus or a, or a gift card or something, um, it, it, it isn't as effective. So those- yeah, and it's irritating as hell when, when for, as an employer, when employees just expected a Christmas bonus. I, I mean, it was very irritating to me because I'm like, that's a bonus. That's not something. It's a gift. It's not something you should expect. Right. It was it was very irritating to me. I'm clearly I'm not sure why. I mean, clearly I have issues with that. But. I like the random idea. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is I have to quote a book. Uh, I know you and I are both scribe authors. And so another scribe author is, I think it's Lorenzo Gomez, who wrote about the rack we built. And he quoted somebody in that book. And I use this all the time. I'm probably going to mess it up. But everyone wants to be an important part or a valued member. Let me put it that way. Everyone wants to be a valued member of a winning team on an inspiring mission. Mm. And those really go with my book. When I read that, I'm like, yes, I wish I thought of that because that's really what it all goes with. But those are the things that are going to work better than, than um, increased pay. Pay is good, you know, just to solidify that you've got that person. But these other things, and everybody wants compliments and recognition. Those are all great things too. Of course, you want to compliment somebody on a job well done. Um, but everyone wants to be a valued member. So once again, a team member that has a sense of belonging, a sense of being valued for the diversity, the talents, the unique talents they bring to the team. You as the boss need to make sure that every member feels valued because if you've ever been, uh, on a team where you were the last one picked, uh, you know, as a kid. It sucks. Right. And the coach, I remember being a Girl Scout in Brownies and the leader could never remember my name. Mm. I didn't feel part of that Brownie troop. Uh, I wasn't a valued member of that troop. Um, And you remember it how many years later, how many decades later? Right. So the leader did not show me as being a valued member to the other Brownies, right? She didn't even know my name. So she knew nothing about me, didn't know anything that could be part of uh, some benefit or value on the team. I didn't, I didn't go to Brownies the next year because of it. So, so a valued member, a valued member also is in the loop on communications. I mentioned that uh, earlier. Team members need to know what's going on. If you have something going on in your firm that may impact them, you know, the um, people will talk whether they know the facts or not. So if they feel something's going on. And they do, they know. They're going to make up the story because they've got to fill in the blanks because right. they, they feel stress in the air. So even if you say to them, you know, there's something going on that I can't talk about right now. I'm going to keep you informed as soon as I know. That's better than saying nothing. So uh, again, valued member where you're in the loop on communications, you feel part of the team, the team leader or your boss is acting like you're a valued member to the other team members. Then to be a winning team. So the winning team is you're a successful law firm. You're achieving what you want to achieve. You are making a difference for your clients. Do each of your members, does your administrative staff know how you're making a difference for your clients? Are you ever talking about it? At staff meetings, are you saying, this person, here's what we did, here was their reaction to it. It made us feel so good. It's going to make them feel good too. Their support for you. And they want to know, directly, how am I affecting the clients? How is my help Mm. affecting the clients? Are we reaching our goal? Are we being who we want to be? I encourage every business to have a mission. So, and to make sure that every employee knows that mission. So a simple mission, you know, for a law firm can certainly have one. Who are your clients? What's your specialty? What do you want to achieve in the world? What impact are you making? Everybody who works for you should know that. And they should know how their job moves that forward and helps make that impact. So I want to be a valued member on an inspire uh, on a winning team. 
on an inspiring mission. And that's what everybody wants. I mean, how, how do you deal with attorneys have a very difficult time delegating, you know, it's easier just to do it myself. Right. Um, a lot of issue with giving up the control. How, how do you walk somebody through that? So here's why it's important. Please do it with every one of your employees. I encourage you. And, and if you haven't delegated before, don't try it with everybody. If you have more than one person on your staff, it's a lot. It will take you more work and effort than it would if you did the job yourself. But that's just at first. Mm -hmm. Eventually, it'll take you less work and effort. So that's one advantage. Second advantage is it gets stuff off your plate so you can take on higher level, more complicated tasks, the tasks that are probably bringing the, the direct money in. Third, it will help your staff develop. It's going to stretch them. It's going to um, have them make, be more capable. It's going to you know, impact your firm because you're going to be able to accomplish more. And so it's, it's win, win, win all the way around. It's just painful at first. So the way I, um, I say to do it is first you want to decide what you're going to delegate and to whom. So I suggest that you make a list of your tasks. What do you do every day, every week? Um, and hopefully attorneys know they've got billable hours. I imagine they're, they're tracking everything. Well, so. we don't, we don't, this is flat fee. This is, we do flat fees. Right. So that's the goal is to not have billable hours. There you go. <laughs> All right. So you should still be, I bet if you used to have billable hours and now you have flat fee, you still are at the mindset of keeping track of, of all what you do. Not. That's the entire goal is hopefully not. <laughs> not away from that, but either way, uh, keep track of what are you doing? Do it for a day or a week. And you've got a list of your tasks. Then you can look at those tasks, sort them into lower level, less complicated and upper level that you would certainly keep doing yourself. And then look at your list of employees. Who is capable of taking on? So if you have a newer employee um, that, that is a lower level administrative, you look for all your administrative tasks. Could you move some of that over? Now, the trick is going to be, this is not what this person is paid for. They are paid for what is on their position description. They may need to be doing those lower level tasks anyway. You may need to move them right onto their position description because why are you doing them kind of question. So first, does the task need to be done? Second, am I the one that needs to do them? Should I be moving them onto somebody else's position description? If that's the case, then sit down with that person and say you're adding them and then change their position description. If you do not have a written position description, please make one. And assign the person. If you have no written position descriptions, have each of your staff members write their own. Mm, I love that idea. Yeah, because that's great. It's also a, de a delegation. It's a developmental activity, but you can they're the ones who know what they're doing. Right. And you might think that their task just involves this and it actually involves, you know, 20 other things. Right. It's actually more complex than you thought. Right. So one way or the other, either have them write them or if you have them, have them review them and make sure they're up to date. Uh, and so we're talking about training. I, I know that um, I was when I had more employees, I uh, sent even attorneys to some personal development training. And uh, I remember they didn't want to go like I think they kind of thought it was beneath them and, um, because they were with other people like normal people, not attorneys. And I remember um, one associate came came back and because she was very opposed to this. And I said, look, you, I had done it. I said, you do two hours. And if you hate it, you can leave. She called in two hours. She's like, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing thing. Everybody should do this. Um, but I, I, I feel that a lot of attorneys really hesitate putting a lot of money into training their employees. It's like, oh, well, if we can do this free course on the computer, fine. But, and then I've heard other business people saying, you know, you should be spending 10% of your gross on training employees. So where, where do you fall on that spectrum of, and, and why is it good to invest in our employees, especially with their training? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of, uh, a lot of organizations don't, but definitely the way I look at it is every department, if you're big enough to have this, every department had, should have their training budget and they should be at figuring it out, I used to figure it out per head. 
So say you do $300 a head and a, and a staff member, and that's what you put in your training budget. I would let the employee know, I've got $300 for you this year. How would you best like to use that for training? Let them, because they're going to be the one to identify what it is they're lacking, and they can search for their own training and get something that looks appealing to them. And then they've got, you know, they have some stake in the game because they're the one that, that picked it out. If it ended up being bad, it's, it's kind of on them. Oh, I love that idea. Yeah, it empowers them to choose their own training. And that should be part of those discussions you're having on, at the stay interview. And also, uh, I encourage one-on-ones every week. Uh, every employee should have 30 minutes one-on-one scheduled on the calendar with their boss every week. And it being on the calendar. That's a lot of time. It is, but it makes it important that it's on the calendar. And if it has to be rescheduled or canceled that week, it's fine. The point is they were important enough to have it. It will actually, first of all, it's only um, 1.2% of a 40-hour week. So I, you know, you have to ask yourself, are each of my employees worth 1.2% to 5% of my time? And it will end up saving you time if you do it on a regular basis, because what they're going to do is things that they would have dropped in your door to ask you, um, they will, or sent you an email if, you, if you're remote, they will save up the, the lesser important things to talk about at that meeting. So you're going to have less of those impromptu meetings, drop in questions if it's something they can save up. And the 30 minutes agenda ideally is the first 10 minutes for the employee to start out what's on their mind. What are they working on? What do they want to update you on? Second 10 minutes, you new uh, expectations, new projects to talk about. And the last 10 minutes, growth opportunities, for instance, this, what, what kind of training they want. So it, it might not, they, they might the first time use the whole 30 minutes themselves because they're so thrilled to have your ear, but eventually you can get to the 10, 10, 10, but that's something I really encourage. And I, I don't, are you familiar with the scribes Bible? With, their, have you? Yeah. The, their book or their, right, yeah. right, right. Well, their their culture bible on oh, their firm. Maybe not, yeah. Okay. So they they talk about, you know, you're one person. So they want you to bring if something's going on in your personal life, they want to know about it. Not to be nosy, but we're one person and it's gonna affect us. So where how do you recommend where where are we supposed to draw the line? Um, I know I had trouble with that. Like I, I want to be a caring person. Um you know, you're having issues at home, you have a sick kid or whatever. I, I want to know that, but where do you draw the line with, okay, but that's affecting your job as well. It, that's a very, I never knew how to navigate that. Yeah. And it's a balance. So if, if they're having problems at their job, there's performance issues and you have the conversation about, about it, you've, you've given them feedback. You've tried to do some micro adjustments that we do on the, the road. And then it continues. Then you're having more serious discussions, kind of a counseling session. Uh, and you're basically asking them, you know, this is an issue. You're not meeting expectations. Is there anything that you want to talk about that's causing this or how can I help you? Kind of an open invitation. And if they start telling you about some problems they're having at work, then you as a human I mean, at home that is affecting work, you as a human being want to, of course, help them. But I think we have to be careful and keep that professional line of where are we going to draw the line. So a sick child, of course, time off. They've used all their, uh, all their time, their available time. Are you willing? Can you give them additional time? Sometimes uh, organizations can't give additional time. Especially when you're you know, a solo or a small practice. Right? Like, they might be your only person. Yeah. So how can I help you? Can you work off hours? What, you know, be flexible with what you need to meet both, both your goals. So you're trying to get work done at work. They're trying to meet the needs of some issue they're having. But ultimately, you can't solve their problem for them. You can't change everything. You're really more directly involved because this is directly involving work. And you're making adjustments and bending over backwards as much as you are able, capable, or willing. And at some point, you just have to say, you know, I'm so sorry, I can't no longer do this, you know, because they need to meet you halfway, too. Right, right. And how do you find good people? 
Because that, I'll, I'll tell you, that's, man, <laughs> how do you find good people? Oh, I'll tell you, I have, however many years I uh, have been interviewing, hiring people, I do not know. I, I say in the book, I was an assistant manager at a Baskin Robbins when I was 19 years old. And I've been hiring, training, <laughs> leading people ever since. And um, I don't know the answer. You can, a person can be a great interviewee. You can have many, many interviews. You can search their social media. You can get their references. And I've been burned. I have no idea, <laughs> except that you make your best guess. Honestly, I, I have had the same results in having a 30 minute interview, 10 minutes in, I know if I want to hire this person and if they're going to be good. Rarely have I ended up having three or four interviews and made a different decision than I had in my first 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I stopped even calling references because they're either, so the references have already been handpicked. So they're going to, right. be, they're going to tell you. Right. Calling past employers, everybody's afraid of liability nowadays, and you're not going to get the true scoop. Right. Right. So you make your best guess with what you're comfortable with, with the number of interviews and all the research you've done. You give that person everything they need to succeed. You onboard them very well. You let them know expectations and goals right away. You meet with them often in their first 90 days. You do a 90-day evaluation to let them know how they're doing. You stay on top of it with one-on-one -on -one meetings every week. You're um, doing your stay interview. You're monitoring their work. And you are giving them feedback, uh, both positive and negative. The negative is helping them adjust back on. And if they keep veering off the road, you follow the, the line of documentation and eventually termination. And you, do you hire for attitude or skill? I, if you have to choose. Yeah, I, I would prefer attitude. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. And I know it's the word fit has become into some, you know, disrepair lately. I don't know. You know, I used to say you hire for fit. You do want a good fit, but you do want those diverse teams too. So, you know, you, you can get into a habit of hiring people who are kind of like you. <laughs> Who, who feel good, who could be your friends, but you don't want to do that. You want to make sure that you're hiring for diversity. And I'm not just talking about, you know, the usual things we think of diversity, but diversity of skill, diversity of thought. Um, you know, are you always hiring extroverts? Are you really giving a chance to those introverts? They aren't doing as well at the interviews, but what can you you know, how can you delve into and find out about them? You need all those different skills and abilities on your team. It is an entirely different skill set, which I, I don't think that people completely appreciate and realize that, no, this is a completely different skill set that can be learned. But if you want to have your practice, yeah. you got to learn it. Yeah. And it can be learned. I think that's key to it because people couldn't, shouldn't give up. Um, just because it's not their thing. And, you know, there are people who've decided in business, it's not my thing to lead. I, actually, I give the example in my book of my father was a, a mechanical engineer. Uh, World War II, got his engineering degree, first person to ever go to college in his family on the GI Bill. He started working for uh, General Motors in Detroit, Michigan as an engineer, and he was fabulous. And um, his coworker was John DeLorean of the DeLorean car. They worked together. And, and my dad uh, started getting promoted. And he did not like managing other people. He wanted to be a, an engineer. And so he ended up um, really just hating it and ended up uh, quitting at General Motors, went to another company where he stayed his whole career, turned down his bosses, knew he didn't want any. Uh, promotions. And uh, he had a great time. He was, he enjoyed doing what he's doing. So if you hate it, don't, I am an advocate. Yeah. For, and I know this is what you're all about too. I am an advocate for, I do not want to be working every day, hating something I'm doing. And if you are leading people, if you're managing people, that's a big part of your job. So is mm -hmm. there another way, if you hate it, is there another way that you can structure your firm? 
Do you have an administrative person? Can you hire an office manager who supervises these people? Uh, You know, is there another way to do it? Because do not be spending your time miserable. Yeah. And, and so much of the time we, as I say, we as attorneys, because that's what I know we get. And I certainly got into it. I had my empire building stage because I thought that's what you were supposed to do. We're supposed to grow, 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 grow. And I'm not a believer in that. If you want to grow, great. I, I personally want lean. I want small. I don't want a ton of employees. I want as few as I can possibly get away with. I, I've done the employee thing. I don't want to do it. So, yeah, and I, I see a lot of attorneys. They, they, they want to grow because they think they're supposed to want to grow. When in actuality, they're far happier. I can think of two great examples off the top of my head. They did the empire building thing just like I did. And it wasn't really what they want. And now they keep it really lean. They're happy as can be. They're making, they're not overworking. They're making more money than, than they ever did. There's, there's nothing wrong with just being a solo and keeping it real lean. Right. But we get into this, oh, I, I need to grow my practice. I need to grow, grow, grow. There's, there's different ways to do that. Right. And what's the best use of your time and your impact in the world where your talents are best? And if your talents are not in leading, uh, yeah, you need to think about it. It can be learned if you have an interest. If you think you would like to do it, then, then look into it, research it, learn it. But if not, then think about trying to figure out a different way. Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you so much, Leanne. And I'm going to tell everybody, seriously, it's one of the best books on employees I've I've ever read. And um, how do people, if if people want to learn more about leadership, how do they get in touch with you? Yeah, my, I have a website. So my business is called Engaging Leadership. My website is engaging-leadership.com. They can get uh, a hold of me there and see the different things I do. Also, I love to connect on LinkedIn. It's the only social media I am on now. Um, And that my uh, LinkedIn, uh, I'm L-E-E-A-N-N-P-O-N-D pond. Uh, you can find me there. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, congratulations on the book. It's a great book. And I just want to thank you again, just for having a real conversation and um, saying things that sometimes we don't want to hear, but need to be said. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely.